Welcome to Private Club Radio, the industry's first and only program dedicated to education, news, events, trends and announcements. Broadcasting from Tampa, Florida, ladies and gentlemen, here is your host, Gabriel Aloisi. Welcome to the inaugural edition of Private Club Radio. I'm delighted to have you join me here. It's going to be an amazing journey that we take together. Each week, I'll be bringing you guests from the world of private clubs from every corner of the industry. So whether you are a general manager, a membership director, a catering professional, right down to the servers and the bag boys, whatever your role at the club, you're going to have some incredible education on this show. And you're going to learn a lot from some of the experts that I have to bring you. I have some really exciting folks coming on this show. Today is our inaugural episode, January 25th. We're speaking to Mr. Rick Coyne. Rick is the CEO of the Professional Club Marketing Association. That's the association for membership directors and marketing directors at private clubs. It's going to be a really exciting interview. Rick is going to talk to us about the history of the PCMA, sort of what's happened in the club industry in the last 20 years, and his bold predictions for the future of the private club industry. In episode two later today, we have Dick Coplin. He's partner of Coplin and Keebler, an executive search firm for the private club industry. We've got Dan Schmitz in episode three, owner of KE Camps. We have Lynn Lafon DeLuca, executive director of the Association of Club Catering Professionals to tell us what's happening on the catering side of things. She's coming on February 1st. Then we're going across the pond to speak to our friend Alistair Dunsmere. He's the editor of Golf Club Management Magazine in the UK, and he's going to give us the perspective of what's happening in Europe. On February 15th, we'll have Rick Coffey, M3 manager at Club Essential. On February 22nd, Susan Green, who is your 2016 president of the Professional Club Marketing Association, We have Henry Wallmeyer on February 29th. He's the CEO and president of the National Club Association. Those are the guys going to bat for this industry, lobbying for this industry in Washington, D.C. On March 7th, we have Kevin Kaldabaugh, president of the Club Spa and Fitness Association. So as you can see, it's a really exciting and a really diverse lineup that's going to be on this show. My hope is that for you, the listener, this show becomes your go-to source for education, for announcements, to stay up to date on the latest trends and happenings in the world of private clubs. Thank you again for joining me. I'd appreciate it if you enjoy this show to please share it with your friends and with your colleagues. This is a resource that I really want to make widely available to everyone working in the private club industry. So without further ado, I want to bring on our first guest on this first episode of Private Club Radio, Rick Coyne. Rick is the CEO of the Professional Club Marketing Association. The PCMA is an allied association of the Club Managers Association of America, the Canadian Society of Club Managers, and the Association of Private Club Directors. Rick has been engaged in the private club industry for over 40 years in areas of club management and operations, strategic planning, market analysis, and developing successful marketing programs for private clubs. He's worked with over 900 private clubs and has been a guest speaker in over 600 workshops and seminars, both nationally and internationally. Rick, welcome to Private Club Radio. Thanks, Gabe. Great to be here. Rick, I'd love you to have you kind of start off, give us a history of the PCMA from its beginnings. I'd love for you to tell us why did you start the organization and what is the mission of the PCMA? Well, it's uh, we, we've started thinking about uh, developing the association approximately 25 years ago. Uh, we started doing some workshops for um, young professionals that were a- engaged in uh, developing uh, marketing strategies for clubs. And, and uh, uh, just a little over 20 years ago, this is our 20th anniversary, uh, we got together with John Fernero, who is now the publisher of Boardroom Magazine, Donna Coyne and myself, and we officially launched uh, Professional Club Marketing Association. In our um, early days in the formation of the association, we really had several thoughts in mind. One was uh, there were other organizations like CMAA, the PGA, um, 
and for almost every discipline within the private club industry, with the exception of the membership professional. And we felt that um, because of all of the changes that were, were taking place in the industry, that this was a, a group that, that really did need some representation. Um, and of course, along with that representation, we felt that there was a, going to be a great need for education in the field. And finally, like all other uh, associations representing their professionals, we felt that there should be an accreditation program. And so that was uh, the original mission. And I think we've stuck to that uh, since that time. That's awesome. So what are some of your goals for the organization in the short term and in the long term? Well, you know, we every year our mission and, and goal uh, is to research uh, to determine where exactly the industry is heading relative to uh, the needs and wants of of not only our existing members everywhere in the country and in some places of the world, but but also looking at that next generation of member and and what it is that they are going to be looking for in the private club. So our our goals in the in the short term here this coming year, obviously, um, you probably know this, Gabe, but we've been hosting a, a national conference for the past 20 years. The 21st will be in Kansas City in September of 2016. So uh, even though that's almost a year away, we're just hard hard at work trying to get that all organized and structured. Uh, we'll also be doing five regional uh, workshops this year. We have uh, 23 chapters throughout the country today, and we have been doing a Florida symposium every year. We'll continue to do that this year, but we're looking at four other regions around the country to uh, to take out kind of a summary of last year's uh, national conference into kind of um, uh, allow a preview of what we're going to be doing in 2016. Of course, our goal is always towards uh, growing the organization, growing the participation in our annual conference. And I think one of our underlying uh, goals and objectives is um, kind of getting the rest of the associations and organizations uh, thinking in terms of their contribution to how um, a, a solid, healthy club is dependent upon membership growth. Yeah, we're going to get into some of your 360 degree approach here in a minute. I was happy to be at the Nashville conference the this last year in 2015. That was great in the year before in Las Vegas. So you put on a great show. I definitely tell the listeners to check out the PCMA National Conference. If they can make it, it'd be a great place to see it. Yeah, it's not, you know, it's not just the education, it's the networking. And, and you know, we, we jokingly call ourselves the Association of Fun, but we really do try to make sure that, you know, life is is really about enjoying yourself. And, and so in our educational programs, we always manage to find ways to, to really do some fine networking and, and having fun. Yeah, it's a great time. So a lot has changed in the industry since you started the PCMA. What are some of the big changes you've seen take place? And since the inception of the PCMA, all the way up until today? Well, the inception um, was really predicated on some very interesting changes that were taking place, Gabe. And, you know, it's... Um, we we looked at 2008 and you know there was kind of a mobilization in 2008 because the uh, economic collapse kind of forced everybody to say whoa you know we we are vulnerable so i think that would be the the key issue but but one of the things going backwards from there is to say that there were a ton of cracks in the foundation of the private club industry and i think what happened in 2008 was we had a confluence of those cracks and it, it paused everybody for just long enough to say, hey, maybe we should start paying attention. Um, and it didn't happen. You know, 2008 was an alarm clock, but the, the cracks began to develop almost like sand through an hourglass. It just kind of happened. It wasn't something that was so catastrophic that it stopped everybody in their tracks and said, let's pay attention. Some of those things are an aging population. So some of the, uh, the, the big issues are the reculturalization uh, of America. And part of that is the, the uh, uh, relationship of family today 
many of the sociologists today will say that today's child rearing uh, parents are the most um, child centric uh, ever. And, you know, whether the reason is because they're dual wage earner households, that becomes a, a very important embedded piece for us in the private club industry to recognize family uh, gender. Um, you know, so many clubs still harbor that good old boy kind of mentality. And yet when um, we do the research and find that 85 percent of discretionary purchases are being made by the female and women over 50 control three quarters of the nation's wealth, then you take a look at time and time has become the new commodity. These are all the things that are retooling, reshaping the way clubs need to reinvent themselves in order to stay relevant to not only their existing generation of members, but the next generation of members as well. Absolutely. And to that point, I know you do a lot of research with the PCMA. That was one of the goals when you started the organization is to actually come up with some research and industry data that didn't exist. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Well, yeah. I mean, I think uh, fundamentally uh, the club business, while it is a recreational uh, enclave for our members is a very complicated business. And, you know, one of the things that we, we find uh, out there lacking sometimes is, is real market research when a, a club is trying to, to set its initiation fees or set its uh, dues or categories of membership. Very seldom um, has it historically uh, been on the basis of a market analysis. And, you know, what we've learned over the years is that a freestanding club typically has a, a 85% or more of its market within a 15-minute drive time of that club. And so the the market, that that 15 minute drive time is really the people who are going to be capable um, of being attracted to that club. And so you're setting price, you're setting um, the programs, events, activities, everything can be kind of predictable once you understand that marketplace. And of course, one of the other things that's happened um, going back to your last question, but tying it to this one, Gabe, is that uh, competition has become extraordinary. You know, the National Golf Foundation in 1988 at a uh, golf symposium said that there needed to be a golf course a day built between then and the year 2000 simply to keep up with demand. And by and large, there's, you know, 30 some odd hundred uh, clubs, the majority of which were daily fee, were uh, placed into the marketplace uh, since that time. And of course, that has changed the dynamic of competition dramatically. Um, And while we don't see any, we don't see a continuation of that high growth of new clubs, we are seeing now an out-migration, closings at the rate of approximately 180 a year. And my my last intelligence on that was that the National Golf Foundation uh, predicted that 180 per year for the foreseeable future. So that's that's kind of a, a, a thumbnail sketch. But what it says is that clubs have to be uh, increasingly observant of their marketplace today in order to be sustainable. Absolutely. Absolutely. So to that point, how should clubs be positioning themselves given these current factors in the marketplace? It's a great question. I, you know, the, the clubs have traditionally seen themselves as their closed environment. That's their community. That's their club community, uh, their club family, if you will. And when you look at the the marketplace today and the ever increasing need to replace lost members, at least in pace with attrition, it becomes abundantly clear that the club is not just serving one community. It's not just serving that existing member community. Because let's face it, some clubs are uh, made up of, of of an older, more mature generation, and if if that is who they're they're really programming, and all of their events is is driven around that, the next generation of member unless it happens to be a retirement community, is probably not going to be interested in what that club has to offer. So what we're seeing today is a club serving two communities. One is obviously, again, it's existing members, but then it's setting up the relevance, the brand that is attractive to that next generation of member. Typically, most of the studies out there suggest to us that that 
next generation of market in the traditional club is going to be uh, a household with the primary uh, income earner under 55 with children uh, living at home. And so that that demographic is seeing things um, a, a little bit differently, maybe than their more mature uh, members. So it what we're we're seeing clubs today having to program themselves into a much more relevant position. Relevancy is is changing with each generation. I thought I'd morph into my father. I never did. I thought my daughters would morph into me. They never will. And as a consequence, the greatest challenge that clubs have today is is remaining relevant to each of these generations, to the gen to the family, and all of the cross-sections in between. So how does your 360 approach, your Club 360 approach, how does that speak to those needs? Well, one of the uh, the other conditions that we have seen since our approximately 2003 is a uh, remarkable drop in the number of golf participants. Um, interestingly, as, as we did our research in a white paper that we did called Armageddon or Renewal, uh, we found that this was a third life cycle for golf in the last 100 years. And uh, it began in the early 1900s or approximately 4,000 Gatsby-esque kinds of clubs being uh, developed all over the country, very, very high-end enclaves for the, uh, for the very, very wealthy. And as World War II came along, um, many of those closed as the, the, the world was turned upside down. And uh, some of them actually, including um, uh, several that you'd know, were became German prisoner of war uh, uh, camps during World War II. And after World War, War II became the second uh, growth cycle, and that was daily fee. We saw Eisenhower uh, on newsreels playing golf. We, it was the advent of uh, the uh, Nicholas and Palmer and um, era, and we saw them on newsreels. And so uh, an abundance of daily fees. It was a public access period. And then in the late 70s, early 80s, we saw the advent of the high end daily fee and the development course. Each one of them has gone through a high growth, slow growth, maturity, and decline stage. Where we are right now is in the decline stage of the third life cycle. And as a consequence, um, with golf declining, uh, we were forced as an organization and an association to take a look at what is actually occurring in clubs. What's the what's the relevant appeal in a private club? And if you looked at all of the things that a club have, whether it's a swimming pool, dining rooms, uh, fitness center, uh, the aesthetics of a beautiful campus and golf, uh, you'd look at those things and say, all right, how much time, energy and money? call it bandwidth, are we putting into each one of these areas? And almost 99.9% of the time, you find that the area of golf has absorbed most of that time, energy, and money over the years, and in many cases, continues to do that. Right. We felt like maybe that was not the exact right direction, that if the female is making the decisions, and, and maybe she is or maybe she isn't a golfer, and families are important, and time is a new commodity, that we needed to start looking at some of these other areas in the club, like dining and fitness and, and all and the aquatic uh, areas. And uh, as a consequence, we said... The, the world of clubs is a 360-degree environment, and we need to start putting more uh, of our emphasis in these other areas effectively to program, not necessarily to go out uh, and spend a lot of money in capital, but, but certainly in the programming efforts. And when we introduced that um, approximately three years ago, it was very, very well received. Unfortunately, as our attendees were leaving, they said the, the problem with it is going to be to take it back to my club and get my GM and get my department heads and even to some degree get my board uh, to believe in in this concept because golf has been king. And of course, that, that, uh, that message turned out to be true. Uh, and in subsequent years, what we've done is to create white papers for each, essentially each department, uh, 
um, talking about how they can increase that relevance. And when they do, what happens? And the success stories are are essentially out there. We Those clubs that have embraced this 360 and said, you know, we're more than just a golf club. We we really have a lot to offer here and, and expanded their, their image and brand. They're doing extraordinarily well. We've seen some examples of clubs that have been on the rough side of uh, of the equation to gone now to waiting lists because they've be, they've broadened essentially their market appeal in that process. That's incredible. So how do you get the buy-in from the general managers and from the other club uh, department heads? Well, th- that's that's the challenge. And I think you asked about goals and objectives earlier. That one of our uh, objectives is to work closely with CMAA and to, with PGA and others that um, influence their own association members and and bring to them the importance of doing all of the due diligence, bringing uh, to them the importance that each um, person within that club has in sending a brand message and the importance of, of reshaping that brand message to a broader section of the marketplace. As we look at it today, uh, roughly 12 to 17% uh, of people that can afford private clubs are uh, golfers. That means that 83% potentially of the market out there is not interested in what we have unless we make it um, a place that people who are non-golfers want to be. And that's a huge uh, section of the market for us to go after. One of the things that we also looked at in in, in uh, Club 360 was that if there is a continued decline in golf, there there has to be a plan. Um, but even though the PGA has 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 come out with uh, Golf 2.0 and worked very hard at trying to get new golfers into the game, it, it hasn't really. Um, come to fruition. And if that's if we're not getting them on the national level, maybe there's a way in which if we develop and grow our membership from non-golfers and then convert them into golfers, that there is a real future in driving that that new uh, golf growth from within our our existing clubs. I think that's a great approach, and I think it's very underutilized at times. There's so many more. I see that there's a lot of memberships categories being created, like, you know, your social members, your athletic and fitness members. And that just seems like an untapped market where we can actually reach out to those folks and, you know, offer them something, right? Like, you know, a day with the head pro or something like that and actually start to turn them into golfers themselves. Yeah, you, you're, you're so right, Gabe. Uh, traditionally, the, the secondary memberships have almost been looked at with disdain um, that someone paying half the dues could take up the the space in the dining room or the fitness center or wherever else. But the fact of the matter is, is that if you can get them in there, you know, let's face it, you know, the, the time that we have to spend today is different than what it was 10 and 15 years ago. And so my... my I may not have the time today to play golf, but I will have at some point in time. And I and I think what's what's very interesting to us here is that um, I see that secondary membership very much as a holding tank. And if we get our pros out onto the practice tee and we we bring these people who are non-golfers or bring these people in or just occasional golfers and get them more involved, get their handicaps down, get the families engaged, engage the woman. I think if we can get them engaged in golf, we can grow and, and get this this uh, this golfing public healthy again. Yeah, about four years ago, I hired a business consultant. And the advice he gave me is the easiest person to sell to is the person that just bought from you. So I I feel like that's, you know, perfect lead into this that, hey, they're already at your club. They're already enjoying themselves. You can actually bump them up to the next level of membership. Why? It's a lot easier to put your energy into that someone who's already there than to go out looking for new members. That's absolutely right, Gabe. Uh, Looking into your crystal ball, Rick, what's your bold prediction for the future of the private club industry? Well, that's a that's a very heady question. Um, you know, I don't think any of us uh, really uh, knows where it's it's headed. I think the um, 
one of the things that we are seeing is a uh, a lot more of the management companies getting in and, and uh, taking control. The buying power that they bring to the table is often uh, a good interim way to augment incomes. I do think that what we will see in, in the future is uh, a reduction in the mindset that we must remain strictly and totally towards the, the the game of golf. I think we're going to see clubs expand. I can tell you that there are clubs all over Northern California here that have embraced um, something as simple as bocce ball. Many of them boast 400 plus league members. I mean, that's more than you'll find in, in most MGAs or WGAs in, in any club in the United States. And then you look at things like pickleball and you see things like uh, that, that are, you know, I, I played tennis as a young man. My knees wouldn't allow it today, but I can get out and play pickleball. And so we're seeing um, the advent of all these other activities within clubs, clubs within the clubs, the affinity kinds of programs that get people out. I was talking with John McCabe just yesterday. Um, he was at the Union League Club, and and I was always marveled uh, by the Union League Club because every time I went there, which was fairly considerably, uh, fairly often, there would be a luminary uh, author or a politician or a lecturer that you know was world renowned, and and I asked John how many programs that uh, the club actually did in a, in a year's time and he said well over 1200 and most of them were not were not actually sponsored by the club they were sponsored by clubs within the club so i think what you're going to see is uh, the the more socialization of the club lifestyle relevance today is really what it's all about uh, i have precious leisure time when i find time to to uh, take advantage of that leisure, I want to be able to do something that's going to be meaningful to my entire family. So I think we're going to see continued expansion in those areas. Um, those clubs that you look around and see that are doing extraordinarily well have, have typically done one of three things. They've expanded the spa fitness facilities. They have done something to their pool areas that make them much more family oriented. And I mean, you know, the slides and, and all those sorts of things, but also an adult area. Um, I, I could uh, name several clubs around the country, Carmel being one of them that has done an extraordinary job with that. And then multi-level uh, dining. And again, Carmel comes to mind. They hired a uh, uh, chic restaurant design group to come in and, and, and completely redo their dining room um, far differently than than what you'd find in the traditional club dining room setting. As a result, uh, they're seeing uh, increased usage. In most of the surveys uh, that we do as well, we we, uh, we do see a trend towards more lifestyle orienta orientation when we ask people the reason that they've joined or the reason they stay. Um, in most occasions, what we're finding is it is the, the lifestyle events and, and activities that are more important to them than anything. And that usually is the the dining, social activities, uh, spa, fitness, e even pool. I might head to my club right now and play a little bocce ball. We have, they built some bocce courts here at Carrollwood Country Club. Well, it, isn't it amazing? Uh, and I hate to say it, but one of the things that um, that I've noticed in every one that I've visited, there is a, a little wine drinking that goes along with it. So I think this whole social element of being able to be with friends, um, have a glass of wine, and kind of hang out is is really where you know the clubs are beginning to to vacillate towards. Yeah, I remember John from the Boardroom Magazine, who you mentioned earlier. He gave a talk in Las Vegas back in 2014, and he was saying that the club is sort of the piazza, uh, the, the classic piazza of Italy where the neighborhood would come together and sort of just socialize. And that's really what a, a private club here is. Um, I, I just love the way he way he explained that. Yeah, and it is. I mean, I the more and more the the club family um, 
is expanding. And, and you know, it's interesting because we've, we've done a kind of a few uh, very large programs within clubs where we'll just do a two hour cocktail reception for members once a month. And the object of course, is to get them to bring potential members out. But what has happened in doing these things is it's getting people out that maybe haven't seen each other. And so not only are you seeing membership growth from that kind of thing, but you're seeing the retention, um, of the existing members get better, but you're seeing more activities because the more they see one another, the more they want to be with one another. So it's a, really an interesting phenomenon. It's, it's exactly what it is. It's a uh, it's a family piazza. Right. So you've had the pretty cool opportunity to visit some of the most exclusive clubs around the world. So do you have any others that stick out and why? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, they're <laughs> interestingly, uh, in the 45 years this year that I've been in the industry, I've had the opportunity now to work with over 900 clubs, and I've been in probably 3,000, 3,200 clubs, and being as there's only a little over 5,000, uh, that's quite a few of them. Uh, yeah, right. And it's, you know, from my perspective, it's not so much how large and ornate they may be. Uh, it's the kind of the way I'm made to feel when I go to these clubs. It um, And so I look at the campus. I, I look at, you know... Uh, a lot about the f- the family that is that group of employees. Those are the ones that, that stand out. Mike uh, Linus was at um, Congressional for many years, and I did a story for Boardroom uh, as they went into the COO concept. And I had not been to Congressional prior to that, but so totally enjoyed the experience because the, it was a club community uh, of workers. I mean, those folks that worked at Congressional really were uh, a family. And because they felt family, they were they were giving off the experience to everybody w- that was there. So Congressional would stand up there. I just uh, came back from a, a club called Saucon Valley um, in Pennsylvania that um, was part of the steel era days, the Bethlehem Steel uh, company. And um, the campus is amazing. The people are amazing. And uh, so, you, you know, it's there are tons of marvelous properties out there. Desert Mountain is, is one. But because of, you know, for different reasons, six Nicholas courses, uh, six clubhouses and uh, a beautiful campus, uh, um, a progressive way of thinking. They've added uh, walking trails and, and now uh, stables and, and things that were traditionally not viewed um, as being necessary in the, in the private club. I, I like the clubs that, that are out there uh, thinking progressively and taking advantage of, of all of the, the assets and opportunities that they have. Outside the box thinking. I think that's what it's all about. Absolutely, Gabe. All right. So we're going to wrap things up. Thank you so much for being on today with me, Rick. It was a real pleasure having you on the show today. It's my pleasure, Gabe. Anytime. And uh, I hope uh, those that are listening have gotten some value out of this conversation. I'm sure they absolutely have. And if you'd like to get in contact with Rick, you can email him at rick at askpcma.org. Rick, thank you so much for joining me today on Private Club Radio. Thank you, Gabe. I'd also invite you guys to check out Ask pcma.org. That is the official website of the PCMA, the Professional Club Marketing Association. And it's a wonderful resource if you're a membership director or a membership marketing professional. That is a wonderful organization to be a part of. So that's going to do it for this first episode of Private Club Radio. But don't worry, we've got a lot more coming for you. I look forward to speaking to you in episode two and beyond. Until then, here's to your membership success. Just because this round is over doesn't mean you can't enjoy the 19th hole. Check out privateclubradio.com for more. Private Club Radio is brought to you by Shake Creative, the premier marketing and design firm helping prestigious clubs increase and retain their membership. Visit shaketamper.com to learn more.